All right, good morning, everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started because we have a very full presentation for you today. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is session D4. Uh, my name is Reem Gondour, and I am joined by Drs. Mary Kay Kenny, Lady LeBrun Harris, and Jesse Lichstein. And we are all from the Maternal and Child Health Bureau's Office of Epidemiology and Research. Um, because we have such a full um, set of presentations for you, I'm gonna skip the usual biographies, um, but we are all more than happy to chat with you after the presentation. So today's um, panel will sort of focus in three areas. Uh, where I'm gonna open just by providing a brief overview of the National Survey of Children's Health. Um, I'm partly doing that because we're all presenting data from the same data source, so we wanna kind of kill one, you know, multiple birds with one stone there, but also because we wanted to give you guys a, sort of an inside look at some of the design and operations of the survey since you are our primary data users. Um, after that, we'll move into the meat of our presentation where we will be um, presenting preliminary findings, and I wanna emphasize that. Um, we've all sort of started this work, but we recognize we have a long way to go in each one of these areas of inquiry. We will be presenting data for three of the national outcome measures and then one national performance measure. And then we're gonna wrap up very briefly uh, with a quick note on how you access the data as well as um, just some notes about future data uh, collection efforts in 2019 and, and 2020. So with that, um, let me start with an overview of the National Survey of Children's Health. I suspect most of you are very familiar uh, with this information, but just in case. Um, the survey is sponsored and directed by the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, which basically means we pay the bills and we decide what content goes in. It is an annual cross-sectional survey, and we collect most of our data via the internet, but we also have paper and pencil options for folks who want to respond that way. The survey is designed to collect data on the health and well-being of kids zero to 17, and I have a slide in just a minute that kind of talks about the, those content areas. But what is particularly unique about our survey, and I think which uh, you guys are probably well aware of, is that we provide both national and state level representative estimates. On the left, you just see a couple of quick facts about the survey. We are in the field for about eight to nine months every year. Um, all of our data are parent and our guardian reported, so that's important when you hear about the data that we present today. It's all data that were collected from parents and guardians. It takes folks about 30 minutes to get through the survey. Um, we know that from our, the folks who uh, provide us data via the internet. Um, it's probably a little bit longer in the paper and pencil version. And when you combine two years of data, 2016 and 2017, uh, you have about 72,000 kids to do your analyses with. Our weighted response rates are around 40%, and our interview completion rate is around 70%. And that basically means once we identify a household with a child and they've started the survey, about 70% of those folks finish the survey. Um, I th hopefully this is, hopefully I'm preaching to the choir here, but we believe the survey has a broad utility. Um, the primary use, of course, is that it is the data source for 19 of the Title V performance and outcome measures. Um, certainly, we know that once folks get familiar with the survey for those purposes, they use it for other state planning needs. Um, and our federal partners also use the data, namely for healthy people, but also for a variety of other efforts, specifically around developmental delay and autism, things like that. Um, and then I uh, certainly from our perspective, I think there's a lot of folks that use the survey for research purposes, and um, that's a lot about what you'll be seeing today. One of the reasons that the survey does have this broad utility is, I, I believe, really comes down to the breadth and depth of the content that we cover. Um, and that's illustrated on this slide. We cover content in eight core areas, and those um, you can see those illustrated. And this ranges everything from um, condition prevalence, so we ask about 25 different conditions. We ask about healthcare access, utilization, and quality. And then we also ask a, a wide variety of questions around uh, family factors and neighborhood factors that can influence a child's health. In addition to this core content, we also ask content that is age specific. Um, and you're gonna be hearing presentations on two of those topics. So for the youngest kids, we include content on healthy and ready to learn or school readiness. And for the oldest kids, we include content around healthcare transition planning. 
The next three slides are really just designed to give you a snapshot of our three latest data collection efforts. So in 2016, um, we had uh, just over 50,000 completed questionnaires. Uh, over three quarters of those were collected via the internet. We had a weighted response rate of 40.7%. And this was the first time that the survey included content on school readiness or healthy and ready to learn. Also the first time we included content on food sufficiency. That was a special partnership that we had with the USDA and continues. 2017 was, I would say, the first year of what is now our sort of traditional data collection effort on an annual basis, so it's a smaller sample. Um, we had just under 22,000 completed questionnaires in 2017, again, three quarters collected via the internet with a weighted response rate of 37.4%. This was the first time the survey included content on environmental health, and specifically we had two questions, one on pesticide exposure and one on mold exposure, both which were funded by the EPA. And a, a sneak peek on the 2018 survey, so we just came out of the field in late January with the 2018 survey. We are expecting to release the data on Child Health Day again this year, so that's October 7th. Um, we are, were very fortunate. This was a great data collection year for us. We have over 30,000 completed questionnaires, um, and our weighted response rate ticked up to 43.1%. Uh, what I'm particularly excited about in this coming year of data is that it's the first time we have data on early language development. So we added 11 questions thanks to some funding from the folks in the birth defects office down at the CDC. I did want to include this slide. This is actually not information that you would be able to get really anywhere else. Um, and it's one of the things that I think we, as a survey team, many of whom are uh, here with me today, uh, I think it's one of the things that we are most proud of, and that is that we really take uh, what I would call a CQI approach to survey operations. So this is pretty unique for a national survey of our size and scope, but basically every single year we are testing either an innovation or some kind of experiment that we hope will make the survey more effective um, and more efficient and thereby increase um, both the utility but also the data quality. Um, for you all, which are really our primary data users. So just to kind of call out a couple of those items, I know this is a busy slide. Um, so for example, if you look at the sort of top bar in blue, in terms of sampling innovations, and I should say, this really reflects the life of the survey. So we're sort of doing these innovations throughout the entire year of each survey cycle. So in this case, we worked with the US Census Bureau to create um, a first of its kind child flag. And that basically allows us to target very limited resources to those households that are most likely to include children. So this is an efficiency thing. Um, this allows us to use few do fewer dollars to contact more households and ultimately, we hope, get more responses. Um, we also put a lot of time and energy into trying to meet folks where they are at. So in other words, um, we don't you know, keep sending somebody an invitation to reply to the survey via the internet if we really don't think they're going to want to do that. So we will immediately send those folks a paper and pencil um, questionnaire. That's um, something we're able to do by mining administrative data that the Census Bureau has. We spend a lot of time on branding, so even down to the color of the ink on the envelope is something we spend time thinking about and testing different ways to increase the likelihood that someone will actually open our questionnaire and provide data. And then finally, every year we do cognitive and usability testing, and this is to make sure that our respondents are really able to get through the survey as easily as possible, but also to provide high quality data for you. Um, obviously, there's a lot more we could say about that, but I think in the interest of time, um, we'll move on to the meat of our presentation. Just as a reminder, there are 19 outcome and performance measures that are tracked using the survey. We're going to be presenting data um, on four of them, which are highlighted on this slide. And with that, I am actually your first presenter, so I'm going to stay right here and just keep going. Um, so let me start by saying uh, this is some very preliminary work, and it's work that no one else has seen yet. We wanted to make sure that we really debuted it for you um, who are working at the state level and will ultimately, hopefully, be using the National Outcome Measure 13. 
um, on school readiness. And before I say another word, I do want to have a special thanks to Dr. Ashley Harai, who's in the audience. Without Ashley's help, um, I may not have been able to do this presentation. She is absolutely a partner in crime here, so thank you, Ashley. I am going to deviate a little bit from what um, my other co-presenters are going to do because I think it's probably important to spend a little bit of time just reviewing the genesis of this measure, how we even added content to the survey, how we came up with the pilot measure um, before I actually present some results uh, for you because this is all new territory for all of us. Um, and then after presenting some of the results, I'm going to just also take a few minutes to tell you about where we're going in the future because this is a highly iterative process for us. Um, this slide is designed to provide a very high level overview, sort of a streamlined picture of what we did to create um, the pilot outcome measure. I can promise you it was not this neat and tidy and it does not, can, it continues to be a little bit messy, but here's, here are some of the high level points that I, I hope you can take away. Um, the first was that we had a really unique opportunity to do this work starting in 2012 and 2013. And that was um, really because of two things. One, we were pulling the national survey out of the field to redesign it, so we had the chance to add content. And two, and I think most importantly, we heard from state partners through the process of redesigning the Title V performance performance measurement framework that folks really wanted to do work around early childhood learning, but they just didn't have a data source. And so that was our driver. Um, we had an opportunity to change the survey, and we tried to take that in order to better meet your needs. In order to do that, though, we had to find some guideposts to help us figure out you know, where to even start. We went to the National School Readiness Indicators Initiative, which was work done by 17 states in the early 2000s, and kind of used their framework of the five domains of school readiness. And once we had that, we then mined surveys both in the US, Australia, and Canada to try to find relevant items that could be used to craft a multidimensional approach to measuring school readiness. When we had a set of candidate items, we went back out to the field, we talked to experts, we talked to folks at the state level, um, and ultimately called that down to 22 items that were added to the 2016 national survey. And then at that point, once we had our first year of data, we worked with Child Trends, um, a, a nonprofit in Washington, D.C., to conduct confirmatory factor analyses and actually come up with the pilot national outcome measure. This slide really just depicts that last step in the process, um, and it's really just a way of looking at the data that we had and then trying to come up with the outcome measure. So we did a couple of things. We looked at each item, item by item, to see if there were ways that we could distinguish meaningfully between children based on the data that were provided. Ultimately, from that process, we determined that really only 18 items from the survey could be used to measure healthy and ready to learn. Then we looked at ways that those 18 items could be sort of parsed out in unique domains. And from that, we found that we had four domains represented, early learning skills, self-regulation, social emotional development, and physical health and motor development. And then finally, we worked to apply age-specific cuts um, to each one of those domains so that we could really talk about kids, not just in terms of meeting or not meeting um, sort of our expectations, but those that might be in a category of really not meeting their milestones, so those folks really needed support, those who might be meeting some milestones but not others, so those who are at risk, and then finally an on-track group who were really meeting most of the milestones in each one of those domains. Um, this is just for those of you who really want to dig into this. If you want to go back to the questionnaire and see which items fell into which domain, this is a useful crosswalk. So for the purposes of the data that I'm going to present now, um, I should, the, the big caveat here is that I am only using the 2016 data. That's because we made changes in 2017, which means unlike the rest of my colleagues, I can't combine survey years. Um, that will not be an issue going forward, but it is a limitation right now. Um, our study population, it's ki our kids three to five, and the primary outcome that I'm going to be focusing on today is the NOM. So it's that high summary measure, although I will We'll touch on some of the domain specific results. And in terms of the covariates that we looked at, since this is such a new area, we actually cast a very wide net. So we were looking at a range of sociodemographic, health, and family and neighborhood characteristics. And so what did we find? 
Well, we found that, again, based on parent report, about 60, well, 58% of kids were on track in early learning skills. About 80% were on track, respectively, in self-regulation and social-emotional development. And about 85, 86% were on track with respect to physical health and motor skills. This is a pretty different picture, though, when you actually roll all of those domains up. And so what we found is that 42.2% of three to five-year-olds in the US would be considered, again, based on parent report, as on track overall and healthy and ready to learn. Another 48% were in that sort of need support group, meaning they're meeting some milestones, but not all. And then just under 10% really would be considered um, as really in the need of, of support, additional supports. The next three slides are busy, and I apologize for that, but what, I, we, what I'm trying to do here is just show you um, some of the adjusted results. So once we were really looking at just the independent factors um, and, and what was most significant for healthy and ready to learn, I think there's some interesting results to pull from this. Um, the first thing that was really interesting was that a lot of the traditional socio-demographic factors were not significantly related. So no differences were found by sex, race, ethnicity, primary household language, family structure, or poverty. One, again, once you're controlling for all these factors, these were no longer significantly related to healthy and ready to learn. We did see significant results by age. Um, I think we're still trying to work on the interpretation of that. But what I would also, what I would point out is the one place where we saw significant results was around parental education. And such that kids who were living in a household without at least one college edu educated adult were less likely to be healthy and ready to learn. Where I thought the results got particularly interesting was when we started to look at some of the health and family and neighborhood factors. So on the left side, um, you see the results for special health care needs. And what was so striking to me there um, was that particularly for kids that had that reported elevated service need or use and those with functional limits uh, limitations, they were really at a much lower risk, a higher risk of not being healthy and ready to learn, um, such that those with functional limits were 80% less likely to be healthy and ready to learn. Turning to the right side of the screen um, at the, the data that are presented above the dotted line, for kids that were living with a parent in fair or poor mental health, they were 40% less likely to be healthy and ready to learn, and those uh, with two or more ACEs were about a third less likely to be healthy and ready to learn. And some of that story continued as we looked at these family behaviors and some of the neighborhood factors. So, I mean, I think these tell a story that I was sort of expecting, but it's really nice to see them in numbers. Um, so having two exposure to two or more hours of screen time on an average weekday was associated with being less likely to be healthy and ready to learn. Conversely, being read to, sung to, or told stories to on a daily basis and having access to multiple neighborhood amenities like parks and bookmobiles and that kind of thing were associated with higher rates of being healthy and ready to learn. Uh, so this being a panel on state variation, I feel like I would be really remiss not to throw this slide up, but I have to say I think we do so with some reservations. Um, so what this slide shows is uh, the variation in the proportion of kids who are healthy and ready to learn by state. The estimates range from kind of a low of about 26% in Nevada to a high of 59% in New York. Um, but the big caveat here is that most of these states were not statistically different from the national average of 42.2%. In fact, only four of them were different, and those are the ones with the cross-hatching. So Nevada and Idaho were a little bit lower than the national um, estimate where Missouri and New York were higher. Um, with that said, though, I think what this tells me is that there's maybe a wide range of estimates, but not really a lot of variation, um, and certainly no regional patterns. And I think ultimately what, what we pulled, Ashley and I really pulled away from this, is we need more years of data to do this in a reliable way. So I wanted, in full transparency, wanted to give you guys these data first, but I think we do that with a, with a lot of caution. 
So in summary, um, these are my take home points at this point. I think we have a lot more thinking to do about these results. Overall, about 40% of kids in this age group could be considered healthy and ready to learn overall, with a higher proportion meeting domain specific measures. Um, importantly, after adjustment, many of the socio-demographic characteristics, again with the exception of household education, really are not um, the significant factors. The drivers here are the health and behavioral and neighborhood factors um, that ultimately are really most significantly associated with this measure. And what I think is most important here is really the opportunity for improvement. So based on um, some data that I didn't present, we know that about 50% of kids in this age group are actually actually exposed to two or more hours of screen time each day. We could reduce that. We also know conversely that only about 50% of kids are read to or sung to or told stories every day. That could go up. Um, and also 42% of kids have access to multiple neighborhood amenities. That's more of a structural change, but it's certainly one that could be made. So there's a lot of area here for improvement um, beyond what I think we normally think of as the drivers for being healthy and ready to learn. And then finally, I think when it comes to the state prevalence estimates, yes, there's some wide variation. There's a couple of points that we, we might dig into, but overall I think we may need many more years, not, not necessarily many more years, but at least a couple more years of data to really start telling that story. Um, just in terms of next steps, I would just highlight a couple of things here. Um, we, if you look down to the third box here, we're actually funding uh, a validation contract right now. So when people ask me, so what does it mean that 42% of kids are healthy and ready to learn? And right now, because there's no other data source, I can't really tell you what that means. Um, we are in the middle of a pretty deep validation study, which we hope will put some um, context around that number and help us map it to, to what other data are available across the nation. Um, and then finally, this summer, we're going to be doing a deep dive into these individual items in, through cognitive and usability testing, not just to assess whether or not parents kind of generally understand what we're asking, but how they interpret these questions. And with that, I will turn it over. Hi everybody, my name is Jessie Lickstein and I am going to talk to you about state level variation and mental health treatment among children in the U.S. with mental health conditions. And when I'm talking about mental health treatment, I am talking about in the framework of National Outcome Measure 18, which is the percent of children ages 3 to 17 with a mental or behavioral condition who receive treatment or counseling. Um, and when looking at this measure, it's the um, percent of kids 3 to 17 with a current mental health condition who receive uh, treatment in the past year. A little background on mental health conditions in childhood. Um, about one in five kids has a mental health condition, um, and the prevalence of some, some conditions has been increasing over time, including depression and anxiety. Um, it's also the biggest part of direct medical uh, spending for kids. About 15% of direct medical spending is for mental health conditions, and it's about an average of just over 2,000 per kid for medical spending. Um, Mental health conditions can impede child's ability to achieve milestones and function in daily settings, and um, development of mental health conditions in childhood and adolescence are associated with having these conditions in adulthood. Um, despite the prevalence and some of these negative outcomes, early, uh, uh, early treatment and receipt of mental health treatment is low. For a little bit of why that might be, we know there's a shortage of mental health workforce in the U.S. Um, nationally, there's an estimated 8.67 child and adolescent psychiatrists per thousand children. This also varies across the states. Um, it ranges from about 3.1 per thousand in Alaska to 21.3 per hundred thousand in Massachusetts. Um, there's also been a shift um, from receiving care and specialty mental health care services to other settings. Um, so in 2005 and 2007, the percentage of adolescents who received care in educational settings was about the same as specialty mental health settings. In addition to that, about 3% received care in pediatric or primary care settings. So we're seeing a shift from that specialty mental health to other locations. Um, we also know that um, mental health policy and programs are designed and administered primarily at the state and local level, and there is substantial variation and mental health policies and programs um, in terms of parity, in terms of what conditions are covered, in terms of the severity of conditions that are covered um, by insurance. So there's a lot of variation going on with that. 
So really what I wanted to do with this was to use that combined 2016-2017 National Survey of Children's Health data to examine the state level variation and the prevalence of current mental health conditions and also examine that state level variation and the receipt of mental health treatment among children with current mental health conditions. Use the 2016-2017 National Survey of Children's Health. We limited it to children ages 3 to 17 years old. Um, and there were two kind of main outcomes of interest. The first was a mental health diagnosis. This was a parental report of current anxiety, current depression, or current behavior or conduct problems. Um, and then we also looked at mental health treatment, which is among those children, the percent that received medical health care in the past 12 months. Um, controlled for a number of child and family characteristics and did both unadjusted and adjusted um, associations as well as state level estimates. Just to touch a little bit more on how we look at mental health treatment um, in the National Survey of Children's Health. So there's a question about during the past 12 months, has this child received any treatment or counseling from a mental health professional, which includes psychiatrists, psychologists, psychiatric nurses, or clinical social workers. Um, and just to keep a note as we're walking through this, um, that this is mental health professionals, so mental health treatment by mental health professionals, which will be something we touch on a little bit later. Um, the no's are coded together, so it's a binary yes or no. Getting to the meat, um, so overall about 12% of children had reported met a mental health condition in 2016-2017, which accounts for about uh, 7.4 million children. And as you can see, when you break down by the different diagnoses, anxiety and behavioral conduct pro pro uh, problems have a higher prevalence versus depression, which is a little bit lower at 3%. All right, just to orient you a little bit, um, so these present state level prevalence of each of the three mental health conditions separately and decided to present them separately because as you can see, there's a little bit of a difference in the um, geographic dispersion of these things. Um, each map is broken into quartiles with the lightest blue indicating the lowest prevalence and the darkest blue indicating the highest prevalence. So starting in the upper left corner with anxiety, um, anxiety prevalence ranges from 3.3% in Hawaii to 14.9% in Maine, which is over twice the national average. Um, depression ranges from 1.3% in Hawaii to 6.2% in, in Iowa, which again is about half the, uh, twice the national average. And behavioral and conduct problems range from 3.9% in California to 11.9% in Kentucky. Um, a couple things to note, um, some states do have high prevalence for all three of the conditions, including Maine, Montana, Kentucky, and Indiana. Some have low prevalence for all conditions, including California, Texas, Nevada, New York, and New Jersey. But really, the rest of them kind of vary. So some have high and low for different conditions. Um, also, if you look at the behavioral conduct problem map, you can kind of see that there's more of a, a stronger prevalence in the southern region um, than the other two. For men, um, mental health treatment, only about half of children um, received a mental health treatment in the past 12 months, as reported by a parent or guardian. Um, but it really did look different depending on the condition. So it was highest for kids with depression, around 76% of kids with depression had mental health treatment in the past 12 months, um, versus 58% for anxiety and 51, uh, 50, about 52% for behavioral conduct problems. Once we adjusted, um, there are only a few factors that remain significantly associated with uh, mental health treatment. So what's presented here are the adjusted pre uh, percentage points dif differences and the prevalence of mental health treatment. Um, this is among children just with anxiety. And just to orient you, the blue bars are positive associations and the red bars are negative associations. And these are percentage point differences. So for, let's say, age group, kids who are 12 to 17 were 15.7 percentage points more likely to have uh, mental health treatment than kids ages three to five. Um, so um, older age was associated with more likely to be having treatment. Um, children with special health care needs were more likely. And also those with comorbid depression or behavior conditions were more, li more likely to have mental health treatment in the past um, year. Lower income levels and, uh, were, were associated with less, being less likely to have mental health treatment. And those kids with any physical comorbidity were also less likely to have um, any treatment in the past year. Results were somewhat similar for depression. Um, again, those uh, older kids were more likely to have treatment. Um, CSHCN were more likely to have treatment and um, co-occurring behavioral conduct problems were more likely to have treatment. Um, and then for the lowest category of FPL were less likely and again, that physical comorbidity was uh, associated with a lower likelihood of having a mental health treatment in the past year. Um, fewer were associated with uh, behavioral conduct problems. Um, CSHCN, so comorbid CSHCN, depression or anxiety were all associated with a greater likelihood. Um, and then FPL was the only um, 
variable associated with a lower likelihood of mental health treatment. Just to start out, um, these are state level variation. I wanted to show this because you guys are very interested in this. So we're wide confidence intervals, so please interpret these with caution. Um, again, these are um, going from the lowest prevalence to the highest prevalence. Um, treatment among children with anxiety ranges from 37.9% in South Carolina to 86.1% in DC. Treatment among children with depression ranged from 51.1% in Kentucky to 94% in Connecticut. And treatment among children with behavioral condition problems ranged from 33.2% in Louisiana to 72.5% in Maryland. Um, after adjustment, only a few um, states were significantly different from the national average. Um, for anxiety, that included DC being higher than the national average and Mississippi, New Jersey, and South Carolina being lower. For depression, um, Alaska, Connecticut, Delaware, DC, and Hawaii were all higher. And with behavior, Illinois, Maryland, and uh, Illinois, Maryland were higher, and Louisiana was lower. So one of the things that I really wanted to do, and hopefully this is a relatively clear presentation, was basically kind of overlay those maps. So if you're looking at prevalence and you're looking at treatment, who's got high, who's got low, kind of what do those quadrants look at? So um, this is kind of a quadrant look of lowest, uh, lower left is, oh, sorry, Lowest quartile prevalence, lowest quartile treatment, lowest quartile prevalence, highest quartile treatment, highest quartile prevalence, lowest quartile treatment, and highest quartile prevalence and highest quartile treatment. And really, um, really look focused on those states with high prevalence rate, rates. So looking at states with highest quartile prevalence and the highest quartile treatment, for anxiety, Montana, Connecticut, and Indiana had both really um, in that high quartile of prevalence and also that high quartile of treatment. For depression, Iowa, Maine, North Dakota, and Pennsylvania had a high prevalence and high treatment, and Montana and Wyoming for behavioral and conduct conditions. And these are states that we can start to look at to see what they're doing to learn from and see you know, kind of how um, they're kind of reaching their large proportion of kids who um, need mental health treatment. Looking at the highest quartile of prevalence but the lowest quartile of treatment, um, for anxiety, Kentucky and Utah had high prevalence but low treatment. For depression, Kentucky, Colorado, Louisiana, Louisiana, and Indiana, that's a mouthful, um, had a high prevalence but low treatment. And for behavior and conduct, South Carolina and Arkansas had um, high prevalence and low treatment. And I like to think of these states as having the most potential for being able to increase the proportion of kids who um, need mental health treatment and um, to get mental health treatment. The last thing, and this is um, it's a little busy, so I'm going to walk you through it is we also have a question of the National Survey of Children's Health that asked during the past 12 months, has this child taken any medication because of difficulties with his or her emotions, concentration, or behavior? And one of the things that I kind of wondered as I was looking at this were, are those states with the lowest treatment rates, do they have higher prescribing rates? Do you have more kids who are on medication and being treated that way? And what you can really see here is the answer seems to be yes. This is very preliminary, um, but if you look on the left, that is from lowest, um, basically the lowest um, states with uh, mental health treatment, starting with South Carolina and going up. And then if you look at their medication only, they're in the highest quartile for treatment um, with medication. Um, and so this is really an area to kind of look at further to see what policies and programs are going on in these states um, and to kind of look and see um, breakdown by conditions as well. So just for the conclusions, um, mental health prevalence and mental health treatment vary by state. Um, and those places of that intersection of prevalence and treatment are a place to kind of highlight states for improvement and uh, highlight states to mimic. Um, what we can see with the lower rates of mental health treatment on children with anxiety and behavioral conduct problems may be related to location of care. So primary care providers and educational providers may be more comfortable treating anxiety and behavior problems than depression. Um, and also that comor comorbidities do seem to play a role. Um, so there is a, in the mental health field, there's kind of this quadrant, um, I'm really big on quadrants as you guys can see. Um, that you look at the difference between the severity of physical and mental illness, comor comorbid, comorbid illness. Um, and so depending on that quadrant, so for quadrant one and two, that if you have low or high severity physical but low severity mental health, you might be more likely to be seeking care in primary care and receiving treatment there versus um, lower or high um, severity of mental health. With high severity mental health, you're probably going to be looking at specialty mental health care. So the location of services and comorbidities may be playing a role for where children seek care. 
Um, there's also state level variation in prevalence and treatment may be linked to mental health coverage and parity. Um, so there is a higher prevalence of law of the conditions in the Northeast where there is uh, greater coverage for mental health conditions. Um, state level variation in prevalence could be linked also to mental health workforce. Um, so in this map, you can't, if I could overlay it, I would, but what you will see is that a lot of those states that had um, lower prevalence for treatment actually have a higher um, likelihood of being in mental health HEPSAs. Um, so there is a little bit with the, the mental health providers as well. And that is it. And with that, I will turn it over. Hi, my name is Mary Kay Kenny, and uh, I'm grateful to see everybody here. Um, I'm going to talk about children with excess weight and the geographic variation that I'm looking at is uh, rural and urban uh, residents. And this is probably even more preliminary than the other preliminary analyses. Uh, we're still at the, the variable discovery stage and thinking about methodology. So with a little bit of background, um, children with, uh, this is not any news to anybody here, children with excess weight are at higher risk for adverse how outcomes, and these include things like uh, elevated blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, glucose intolerance, type 2 diabetes, and other health conditions, sort of cardiovascular conditions that were once thought uh, not possible in childhood. We know from research that there are uh, influences at a variety of levels, at the child level, including child traits, um, their child behaviors, family, family level, and the wider societal exposures. And programs that seek to address these in uh, rural children must understand the, the, the variation in, in these individual and uh, environmental influences. But currently, there is no national representative study that looks at the child within the context of this uh, ecological framework uh, among rural children. So the objective here was to look at uh, our nationally representative data from 2016 to 2017 and start looking at the prevalence across these areas and I'm looking at urban, large rural, small rural, isolated. So, um, so the, that small rural and isolated areas are collapsed together. And the ecological framework that, uh, that I'm talking about is the one that would be gra graphically represented here. So the child being embedded within the family, the family embedded in larger uh, geographic structures like the, or, local structures like schools, uh, within communities, within counties, within states, so f and so forth. So we're looking at 36,000 children aged 10 to 17 years, and we're looking at a dichotomous outcome of children with excess weight, and that's calculated by uh, using BMI for age, uh, with a uh, looking at children 85 percent or higher percentile rank, or percentile rank uh, using the CDC growth charts. The, the predictor for the residential predictor is the rural urban community, commuting area codes. So there, there are actually 10 primary codes and this was a, a, a something developed in a, a system that was developed and come in uh, jointly by the um, USDA and HRSA. And so I'm collapsing those into those three areas. The potential predictors are child and family associated demographic characteristics, child behaviors that, we have, that have been previously found to influence excess weight, family characteristics that potentially could or have been found to uh, be related to weight, and the contextual factors currently are linked county level factors that, uh, that are in the, the USDA Food Atlas database, and they are composed of food access and fitness, uh, fitness center availability. 
So at this point, we're just looking at cross tabs and using chi-square and specifically focus on that 10 to 17 year age group because that is the age group in the survey for which we have uh, parent reported height and weight. The, so we're looking, we are within that excess weight category, we're looking at children with overweight and children with obesity separately or individually. The child factors, we're looking at those vis-a-vis -vis the CDC recommendations of 60 minutes daily of physical activity and no more than one to two hours a day of screen time. Another child factor that's in the survey that doesn't, is not connected with any particular guideline is participation in sports activities or sports lessons. The family factors that we have in the survey include eating meals together, and we've chosen four more days a week, and the ability to afford good nutritious food, which is, I think, a relatively recent food sufficiency uh, factor that's in the survey. The contextual factors, so the database, the food atlas has continuous or quasi-continuous level factors which we have uh, we collapsed into quartiles. So we're looking at children who living in areas with the highest quartiles of adult obesity, the lowest quartile of recreation facilities per 1,000 people uh, population, and then the highest quartile of people in in uh, the general population living in food deserts, children living in food deserts, uh, and the low-income people living in food deserts. So th these are separate, three separate types of variables that are, that are in the atlas. And by, by food deserts, they, the atlas has specific definitions, which are, uh, for a food desert would be, and then they call it low access, would be, more than a mile in an urban area, more than a mile from a food market um, or some kind of a food warehouse, a supermarket, and for people in rural areas, it'd be more than 10 miles. So these are the prevalence rates by rural urban area, and we're looking specifically in the blue, uh, overweight, and in the red, obesity. So children in large rural areas were more likely to have excess weight than urban children. So, um, and children in small rural areas were equally likely to have excess weight than urban children. So we're looking at those two starred bars in the middle, that's the, the large urban area, and comparing that to the, uh, so 18.8% .8 compared to 15 in the urban area and 19 percent compared to the 15.6 percent. So here are some of the child lover factors that we've so far looked at and those, they are the physical activity, screen time, and sports activities. Children in small rural areas were more likely to meet the CDC physical activity guidelines than urban children. So in that, the starred column, 26.1 percent all the way on the left compared to 19.1 percent uh, in the urban section. Children in all areas were equally likely to meet screen time guidelines and participate in sports teams or sports, other sports activities. So uh, the family factors that we have to look at currently are four plus meals a day per week, eating, that is together, sitting down and eating together, and always having good food to, to be able to afford good food. Children in small rural areas were more likely to, than urban children to eat the family meals together, and children in small and large rural areas were less likely to uh, be able to afford good, nutritious food. So that's the, uh, the in the first case, it's 71.2% compared to 65.5%, and in the second case, 58.3% and 56%, compared to 65%. So here are some of the county level factors. We're looking at uh, children in small and large rural areas as being more likely than urban children to live in counties with the fewest recreation facilities. So those two top bars that are starred compared to 65.7% and 49.2% compared to 28.2% 
and uh, children living in small and large rural areas were more likely to live in counties than with the highest obesity rates. So that's the, the bottom set of bars, those small and large rural areas compared to the urban area, which are the, the small and large rural areas that are starred. So the, the remaining county level factors, uh, children in small and large rural areas were more likely than urban children to live in counties with the highest rates of low income people living in food deserts and uh, children in all areas were more likely, were, I'm sorry, were equally likely to live in counties with the highest rates of children in general population living in food deserts. So, so uh, across those three different kinds of food desert uh, measures, it was strictly the, the children living in counties with uh, high rates of low income people living in food deserts. So in a summary, uh, a high rate of excess weight was associated with living in large rural areas, but the physical activity was uh, measured as being greater for children living in small rural areas. Healthier family p uh, patterns of eating together were associated with small rural areas, but families in all rural areas were less likely to afford good nutritious food. Living in small and large rural areas was associated with higher rates of exposure to adults with excess weight and few recreation facilities. Small and large rural living was associated with higher rates of exposure to low income food deserts. So what we've seen is that there is a variation in the uh, distribution across geographic area of excess weight and there's some indication that there are some potential environmental factors uh, that, that could be influencers. At this point, the, the idea is that we will move forward and looking at more uh, factors within the survey. So there we've done uh, analyses previously showing that, that there are neighborhood factors that, that are in the survey that also indicate association with excess weight. And then there are other variables to look at in the context of the, the food atlas. And so there are things like uh, SNAP, uh, receiving SNAP. Uh, there are other things like uh, being within a uh, certain distance of farmers' food markets where they could uh, potentially be, uh, have access to fruits and vegetables, uh, which are important for, for maintaining a, a healthy weight. So with that, I will turn it over to Liddy. Good morning, everyone. Raise your hands if you have gone cross-eyed from all the data that we've thrown at you so far. <laughs> um, it's a lot to take in in a short amount of time, so hang with me for a few more minutes. Uh, we're going to do one more national performance measure. Um, and then Reem's going to wrap it up. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, national performance measure number 12, which is healthcare transition planning among youth with and without special health care needs. And I'm going to be looking at geographic differences both um, at the state level and also um, at the urban rural um, level. I uh, just want to start off with some acknowledgments from, uh, for some of my co-workers uh, and colleagues who have supported my work in this area. So what is healthcare transition? It is an organized process whereby uh, young children or youth uh, go from receiving care, healthcare in a pediatric model to an adult model, and that includes preparation for the transition as well as the actual transfer of care and then integration into adult-centered uh, care and follow-up. And this has the potential to touch a large number of youth in this country. There are currently about 25 million youth between the ages of 12 and 17, and about a quarter of those have special health care needs. Um, in 2011, the, the topic of health care transition really was put on the map uh, when a joint clinical report was published. Um, and this report really emphasized the, uh, the value and the benefit of uh, providing structured processes for supporting children and youth as they transition to adult health care. 
Um, the report uh, provided an algorithm for providers to implement in their practices and, and emphasized the, the, that this preparation needed to start as, as early as age 12 with the actual transfer happening around the ages of 18 to 21. And as you know, transition planning is now a uh, Title V uh, NPM, and it's been selected by 36 states as an area of focus. Uh, this is the national performance measure. It's, uh, we call it the percent of adolescents with and without special health care needs, ages 12 through 17, who've received services necessary to make transitions to adult health care. And uh, as you can see, we measure it separately for children with and without special health care needs. And I just want to highlight that because the survey that we use to, to measure this uh, measure only goes up to age 17, really what we're talking about here is transition preparation or planning and not the actual transfer or follow-up afterwards. So um, what, why does healthcare transition matter? Why is it important? Uh, previous research, research has shown that youth who receive uh, this preparation are more likely to be able to manage their own health and health care. Um, but in the absence of receiving a structured transition preparation, they're uh, more likely to lack knowledge about their own health care, uh, health conditions, medical history. They're um, more likely to uh, miss preventive health care visits, to have gaps in care. Um, they're less likely to adhere to their treatment, uh, more likely to experience medical errors. And then ultimately that leads to increased uh, preventable ER and hospital use and um, higher costs of care. So the objectives for this study were twofold. Uh, first, to provide updated estimates of transition planning among youth with and without special health care needs. Um, and I just want to point out that last time this was measured um, at the national and state level was in the 2011-2012 National Survey of Children with Special Health Care Needs. So at that time, transition planning was only captured for children with special health care needs, and we now, starting with 2016, are also able to look at it for children without special health care needs. Um, and the second objective was to look at geographic variations in transition planning uh, among the two populations of interest. And in the spectrum of preliminary analysis that you've seen here today, I would say that my uh, analysis is the most preliminary that you're going to see. <laughs> All right, so the study population was youth, uh, youth ages 12 through 17, and the outcome of interest was, um, if you go all the way to the bottom of the screen, was NPM 12, the overall measure. Um, but that, that measure is actually composed of three individual elements. So element A, or the first element, we call discussed shift to adult provider, and that looks at whether the, the youth's doctor discussed their eventual shift to a provider that would care for adults. Um, the second element we call active work with youth, and that looks at whether the doctor or, or healthcare provider worked with their patient to gain self-care skills or to help them understand changes that happen in healthcare when they reach the age of 18. And then the third element was uh, time alone with provider. Did, did the youth have time to speak with their provider privately at their last preventive care visit? So each of those elements are coded yes, no, and then we roll them up together to create NPM 12, and all three of those elements need to be met to get to NPM 12. Uh, these are just screenshots of the actual survey items that are used to inform those elements. Um, small font here, but if you want to circle back to the actual language, we can always come back later. All right, uh, so the three variables of interest were special health care needs status, um, state of residence, which is self-explanatory, and then uh, something I'm calling population density, which is really just an urban-rural measure. It's different from the one that Mary Kay just talked about. Um, this is based on variables that are actually available in the public use file, so you could produce these, uh, these categories yourself. Um, the measure that Mary Kay talked about, the RUCA variable, is only available in the internal survey file. So um, the list goes from most urban to most rural at the bottom. Um, the analysis was, was pretty straightforward. We just calculated unadjusted prevalence rates for healthcare transition planning for youth um, overall and then looking at the individual elements. And then we looked at differences based on special healthcare needs status uh, by state and then by population density. Okay, results. Um, so this is a Venn diagram that shows you the rates of youth meeting the individ three individual measures or elements, and then you see the intersection of two elements at a time, and then in the center you see the, th the intersection of all three, which is 
the NPM 12, the overall healthcare transition planning measure. And as you can see, only 15% of youth uh, met the overall measure in 2016-17. Um, the rates of individual elements were obviously higher, but when you start stacking them up on top of each other, the rates go down. Uh, this is breaking down the results by special health care needs status, and all of these differences are statistically significant. Um, and the, the, on the leftmost side, you can see the results for the overall NPM 12 measure, and that shows you that the rates of transition planning were slightly higher for youth with special health care needs than youth without special health care needs. I'm sorry, did I say that right? Youth with special health care needs versus youth without special health care needs. Okay. Um, but there were interesting differences when you look at individual elements. So um, youth with special health care needs had higher rates of working actively with their provider and receiving time alone with their provider, but youth without special health care needs had higher rates of discussing the shift to uh, an adult provider. All right, these are differences based on population density. Um, same measures that we're looking at as before. Um, and then going from left to right, the dark red bars represent the most urban areas, and the light pink bars represent the most rural areas. And there were a few differences here, actually. The only one that was different was um, the element looking at discussing the shift to adult providers. And in that case, um, children in, or youth in the most ur rural areas were more likely to discuss the shift to an adult provider compared to uh, youth in the most urban areas. And these are uh, two maps looking at the state level variation um, for the two subpopulations of interest. And as you can see, um, a large uh, high, rate, high rate of range um, across states, um, as low as 6% for youth with special health care needs, um, I believe that was in Florida, and then in up to 39% for the state of Washington, um, which is more than twice the national average. Um, there's also a large range for youth without special health care needs, um, as low as 6% of youth and up to 30% of youth, uh, depending on the state. Um, there's a little bit of um, consistency in terms of regional differences, so you see that um, the, the New England states did pretty well, as well as um, the Midwestern, uh, North Midwest, Midwestern states. Um, interestingly, um, states didn't necessarily do well on, uh, for both populations. So there were some states where they did well for um, youth with special health care needs, but not so well for youth without special health care needs. Um, and um, the, I think this is my last slide. Um, summary, um, so as you can see, the vast majority of youth are not receiving comprehensive, systematic, organized healthcare transition planning, 85% overall. Um, however, you can also see that there are uh, larger proportions who are meeting the individual measures or the individual elements, um, ranging from 36% to 71% of youth. Um, I touched on this in the map slide, um, but the state level performance was not consistent for youth with special health care needs and youth without special health care needs. Um, but despite the low overall rates, the fact that there was significant state variation shows that there's potential for quality improvement um, across all states. Um, and then finally, there were a few differences based on population density. So um, the differences based on urban, rural residents didn't seem to make much of a difference. Oh, and that's me. And here's Reem. So we are really down to the wire here. Um, just to wrap up very quickly, um, for 2019, we'll be in the field starting in June. Very few changes there. Um, and uh, so we'll just sort of leave it there. 2020, we're already planning for 2020. We'll be doing cognitive testing this summer to get ready for that. This is going to be our next really big opportunity to add content. Um, so let us know if there is something near and dear to your heart that you don't see in the survey. This would be the chance for us to add it. Um, just a reminder, there are three places to get to the data. You can go to the HRSA website, which looks like this. You can go to the Data Resource Center, which is childhealthdata.org, that looks like this. Or you can go to the Census Bureau and download the data as well. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a ton of time for Q&A, but I think we're all able to hang around a little bit after the session if you have questions, or please feel free to email any of us. Thank you again for taking the time this morning.